I do not know what God is like unless God chooses to reveal that. And the claim of Jesus Christ, the claim of the Bible is that God is revealed, that he is omniscient, that he's all-knowing. You take Jesus and the Bible out of the equation, and I'm up a creek without a paddle when it comes to answering any questions about what is God like. But guess what? The reason I'm not bummed out by that is there's no way I'm going to have the privilege of getting to know you unless you open up and tell me the truth about yourself. If you lie to me, or if you just remain silent, I'm never going to have the privilege of getting to know you. See, in order to have a relationship, people have to open up and reveal what they are, who they are, what they're like. Well, the same thing with God. If I'm going to know God in a personal way, God has to open up. Otherwise, I can't figure out God. It's impossible. I mean, I can use my reason to get to the point where some type of God exists. But what is this God like? I don't have the faintest idea. So the reason that I asked that yep. question yep. is the Bible in like my reading, right. and the Bible, it says that God knows all of the past, all of the present, and he knows the hearts and minds of individuals enough to know uh, words before they come to our lips, right? right? But it doesn't say anything about him knowing the future. It says he has a plan. Yeah. And I guess my like fundamental like question right. is, is that plan something that is going to happen or something that God is planning on happening? Or is there a difference in those two thoughts? I'm not sure how you would distinguish them in your mind, so I'm not going to try and guess. All I can tell you is, yes, Jesus Christ promised, and the Bible promises, that history is ultimately God's story. Meaning by that, God began history. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and history will come to a screeching halt when Jesus Christ returns in power and great glory, there will be a day of judgment and a heaven and a hell. So yes, Christ promises that history is very real and that ultimately God is over history. Okay, and that history from beginning to end, was that all mapped out no. from the beginning? Okay. No, not mapped out. Okay. Meaning what? Meaning what? No, God did not map it out that I hit her. Meaning, God did not map out that I wear this blue shirt. More specifically, did God map out that he was going to have like a history, not specific things, but like that it was going to end in a judgment day? Oh yeah. Where, okay. Right. Um, because God takes our free will seriously, there will be a day of judgment when he holds us responsible for our free decisions. Okay. So like... The, the flood, was the flood part of the plan from the beginning? No, it's not the part of the plan from the beginning. In the same way, me taking out a gun and blowing her away is not God's plan. Me taking out a gun and blowing her away is an example of my abuse of the gift of free will that God has given me. Now, God is over that, meaning by that, if I think I can get away with that by doing it tonight when nobody watches me, I am naive. Because God is all-knowing, which was where you started, he will hold me responsible for everything that I've done because he is all-knowing. That's why he's a just judge. I'm not going to be able to push something under the table. He's all-knowing. He will judge me fairly. And if I murder her now, obviously you all would see it. But if I murder her tonight and nobody else sees it, and I get away with it, I will not get away with it ultimately. God will judge me on a day of judgment for doing that. Fair enough. If you were going to murder her tomorrow, though, does God know that you're going to murder her today? Yes, because God is outside of time. So due to his perspective outside of time, he sees tomorrow, today, and yesterday at a single glance. And that's really hard for me to understand. What helps me is his omnipresence. God is not just outside the dimension of time, he's also outside the dimension of space, which is why God can be in London, England, and Austin, Texas, at the same time because he is a spirit and he can be in London and in Austin at the same time. He's not limited to the dimensions that you and I are limited to a torso and a head and two arms and two legs. Right. So if God knows today that you're going to kill her tomorrow, right. it's like hypothetical, yep. 
Doesn't that mean that he also knew that he was going to flood the world before he created it? Yes. So, Because he's outside of time, so he sees all of time at a single glance, what you and I call past, present, and future. Right. And so, like, that knowledge of the past, present, and yes. future, how does that help shape his plan? What do you mean? Like, the Bible says that God has a plan, not just for the world, but for each individual, like, person, right? Does it? Because that's a very hard question, okay? Okay. That's you're getting fair. Yeah, no, no, that's fair. Um, yeah, I guess my question, though, is like, okay, so if God knows the past, present, and future, right. and God has a plan, right. doesn't that mean that events like the flood are part of that plan? See, that's where it gets real hard for me. Okay? Slap. That's not God's plan. No. Well, that's something that you did. The flood was something that God did, right? Obviously, it, had, it was like a response to something people did. Thank you. But it was something that God did, right? God did that in response to people committing themselves to evil. He judged them. Before the final day of judgment, he judged them. Yes, sir. Right. Okay. Yeah, I guess it's a hard area. It's a very, very sharp area, and I thank you for raising it, but boy, it's hard. It's God being outside of time, and how does God intersect with us who are in time? And you see, that's the mystery of Christmas, right? Of the incarnation. The mystery of the incarnation is the God who is outside of time, who is eternal, steps into time by becoming a baby born in a manger. Wow. That's a very hard concept. That's not real easy. That's why I could never diagram it for you. And that's why Paul bends over backwards to struggle with that idea in Philippians chapter two, when he talks about God emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a bondservant being made in the likeness of men. And he's talking about the incarnation there. And he's, it's, it's a hard, hard concept. The eternal God stepping into the dimension of time and then stepping out of it when he ascends to heaven. And then bringing history to a close when Christ returns a second time. That's, that's hard stuff. And I'm sorry, because I know we want to get back to it. But I guess like, I'm kind of like formulating this as I'm talking yep, to you. Yep, okay, but, go ahead. Um, so God has this plan. Does the plan have like a goal behind it? Is there a goal of God's plan? Yes. What is the goal? The goal is God created us to love him and to love each other. Why? Because God is love. What does that mean? It means God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit throughout eternity. Love cannot exist if you're just singular. If I'm all by myself. I can't love. There has to be someone else to love. So throughout eternity, Father has loved Son, Son has loved Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit has loved Father. Now. God chose, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who is one God in three persons, chose to create us for the purpose of loving and worshiping Him and loving and serving each other. That is the purpose for which He made us. Okay. Which obviously means God is not a cosmic muscle. He's a personal being who loves. Right. So, I mean, yeah, I think I can get on board with that goal. Okay. My instinct is yes. that like if God is perfect and God is omniscient and all powerful then isn't there a better plan and like I'm I'm saying this with respect and just questioning right yep. like, isn't there a better plan to accomplish that goal that than something that includes the flood that includes the Israelites having to like go to war with all these other nations that in like obviously mm -hmm. there's human nature at play but like right. would God have planned it better if he knew what was going to happen you bet Okay, now, I like you. You asked a very hard question, but you're a humble guy. Okay, but remember something. The typical person who I talk to, who asks that question, has a driving agenda. And the driving agenda is, if I was God, I could have made a better world. That obviously is not what I'm I know. <laughs> but see, it, 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 what you're asking is fairly, it's, it's close, it's in the same ballpark. Right? And I'll never forget the first time a student hit that, me with that. 
I was at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And a student steps out of the crowd and says, you know, Proctor Cliff, it's a pretty crappy world. You're telling me God's good and all-powerful? Boy, if I was God, I'd have made a lot better world than this one. And I'm, you know, I said, whoa. How do you respond to that? I called my brother up that night, the transplant surgeon I've talked about out here. He transplants kidneys and livers. He's far more intelligent than I'll ever be. He had just lost his seven-year-old daughter in a car wreck. So he's got plenty of reasons to question God and to be pretty angry with God, right? So I call him up and I say, Stuart, what would you have said to this student who says, you know, Cliff, if God's really good and if he's all powerful, he should have made a better world. It's a pretty crappy world we live in. And my brother says to me without missing a beat, that is the height of human arrogance. To sit back and not understand much about reality, just a very narrow band of reality that we human beings understand, to sit back and say, if I was God, this all-knowing, eternal, all-powerful being, then I could have made a better world, that's the height of human arrogance. Nobody has the faintest idea about what goes into making a universe and making a world. Right, yeah, that's totally fair. I guess, like, I don't think I could, nor would I want that burden. Right, you bet, yeah. <laughs> but, um, You're totally different, I understand. <laughs> but, my, like, what my intuition, what my mind says, yes. is that if the, like, the being that does have that responsibility and does have that right. knowledge and power, why wouldn't there be a, why, why isn't there a better plan? You bet. The plan that takes all of history and, like, Right. To accomplish the goal. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. And you see, sir, ultimately, I do not know. All right? <laughs> but what I, here's what I can promise you. The cross of Jesus Christ, once you grapple with it and grasp it, the cross of Jesus Christ puts to bed any concern that God is a Scrooge, that he's unfair, that he's messed up. Because the cross of Jesus Christ says, at the very least, God is more than willing to take his own medicine. When he becomes man, becomes a human being, lives a sinless life, what does life do to him? Nails him to a cross. He is a suffering God. So I don't know, obviously, why God created this the way he did. He didn't consult me. Right. And, like, I have no doubts that God is a suffering God. I think there's, like, ample evidence yes. in the Bible to that right. point. The point that I'm trying to convince myself of, that yes. I kind of, like, find myself working through sometimes, is, like, believing that God wasn't surprised when he, when, like, Adam and Eve sinned, or that he wasn't surprised when, like, people just ran amok and he was forced to, like, yep. start over, wipe it clean and start over, you right. know? It's, it, that's the part that I have trouble working through, is that, like, history, like, hasn't surprised God. Good. And I struggle with the same thing. Okay? Now, you're right. In one sense, God wasn't surprised. But in another sense, God had never experienced that. And so that's why we read that God grieved. And that's why on the cross, Jesus Christ cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he experienced separation from the Father because when he's on the cross, God the Father puts the sins of the world on his son Jesus. But throughout all eternity, Jesus had never experienced that. And so he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He'd never experienced that. And there was obviously incredible cosmic loneliness, incredible pain in that experience. But that's, a, you know, that's, that's heavy waters there. That's deep waters, right? That's, that's a lot of mystery there. Yeah, and I don't want to take anything away from like, God, because I don't think, like, even if he didn't know the future, I don't think it would take anything away from the important parts uh -huh. of like, being a suffering God. So right. I hope that isn't the, the hair that I'm going to be off. But I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for raising the issues you did. Greatly appreciate it. I don't believe in an absolute God. I don't believe in the absence of one, but I would impugn the Christian God as evil if he exists. I would be proud to go to hell and hang out with George Bernard Shaw, Socrates, Descartes. I would love to hang out with Aristotle, Plato. The list goes on and on and on of the people I'll be chilling in a really warm hot tub with, okay? 
I reject the Christian God on the basis that he is a child murderer. All right. Well, in light of the fact that he sent his son, his only son, to bleed and die on a cross for you, don't you think you better go back and re-examine your assumption that he gives children smallpox? Assumption? Absolutely false. God has never given smallpox or cancer or HIV to any little child. You're right. In Exodus All right, well, then why did you say you that God no, that gave smallpox to children? God has never given smallpox. He's never given cancer. Okay. He's never given spina bifida to any child. Stop interrupting. Have the bit of respect for me if you claim to be a you thinking person. No, I don't interrupt you constantly. I'm listening to you, okay. and then I'm answering your question. And then when you interrupt me, you accuse me of not answering your question, okay. which is intellectually dishonest of you. There's another attack? All right. Let's no, it's a fact. All right, fine. I'm intellectually dishonest. You just, Keep going. You just do not listen to a response. Keep going. No, I'm finished now. Okay. Well, then your argument is that your argument then is that Jesus washes God's hand. And by the way, when I was going to say you're right, that was to make a joke that he skipped smallpox altogether in Exodus and just killed them. I don't like your sense of humor, so keep making well, your point. Okay? I know you don't because it impugns God. Yeah, it's incredibly arrogant for you to attack God. All right, no, I think God it's a joke. Us all the time. He gave you the gift of life. He, he loves you so much he wants you to spend eternity with him in heaven. No, he threatens. Why do you hate him so? Because he threatens. Me. No, he it offers exists. you eternal life. On the threat of eternal damnation no. and fire. The only reason you will go to hell is if you don't want to live your life together with God. Wrong. Then if you don't want to live your life together with God, you'll spend eternity separate from him. But that's not God's decision, that is your decision. Just like if someone held a gun to my head and ordered me to do something and I refused to do it, you're saying that I chose to take the bullet to the head. It was my choice. Am I choosing? Would anyone here choose like be like, oh yeah, hell sounds great. I want to burn for eternity. No, that's a forced choice. That is what we call coercion. It's a coerced choice because it's not just carrot. You harp on carrot all day, but there's a giant flaming stick called hell. It is not a carrot. It is called growing up. Ah. Guess what? If you guys party, 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 you will flunk, flunk, flunk. Not because they've threatened you but because there are standards, and you fell short of the standards, you didn't study, you partied, 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 you flunked, flunked, flunked. Part of growing up means, part of becoming a mature adult means, that you begin to grapple with the fact that there are consequences of your decisions. Oh my gosh. What horrible, horrible news. You're free to decide to do whatever you want to do, but you're not free to escape the consequences of your decisions. So if you choose to spend your life separate from God, you will spend eternity separate from God. The Bible calls that hell. Thank you. I'm very glad you went there next. That's exactly what no, I was You already were there. I just right. tried no, to answer you. No, I agree. That's where I was hoping you would go with it. <laughs> no, you went there to hell, right. and I and explained to you why a person goes to hell. I was hoping you would describe the reason that someone such as me would go to hell as a consequence for my actions. Well, I'm glad you're happy to get that what answer. What is the one unforgivable sin that, in the face of all the others, the only thing that will unequivocally send me to hell in his worldview. Oh, Jesus answers that. What? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the one unforgivable sin. Now, what does that mean? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit means what I'm doing. God's Holy Spirit. No, not what you're doing. Okay. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit means God loves you, and by his Holy Spirit, he's drawing you to himself, and you keep rejecting him. You reject him, reject him, reject him. What you can get to a point in your life where you have rejected God so much, his love for you, that you become so hard that you no longer hear the voice of God deep within you. Well, I've never heard it. Me neither. I, yeah, he's got the phone pretty solidly hung up. If you've never heard it, then why are you so upset? No, no, because I, and we'll get to that next. No, 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 answer the question. If you have never heard it the way you just said, then why on earth are you so angry and upset? Angry. Okay, let's talk about why I find it important. First of all, you, you brought yourself here to debate, so don't act like I accosted you on the street. I'm merely examining the quality of your argument. No, you're not. Second you have a ton all, of emotion here. So do you. So why? Yeah, that's right. Because I am convinced God is real. I'm convinced that there's going to be a real heaven and a real hell, and I want everybody to go to heaven. Allow me to and so I got a powerful emotion. Five times, and I tried. I did a poor job. I'll admit, I didn't do a, a, the best job explaining 
why I find it important <coughs> to criticize beliefs that are not based on Descartian examination and you know a formation of assumption. Okay, and that's what I call dogmatic. Okay, I find it dangerous. I'm very glad that Christianity contemporarily has ignored the parts of the Bible, like the one I read you yesterday about you know putting women into you know, subjectification. I find it dangerous to tie things like sin to disease, because historically we have seen that in times of strife, that being brought to its logical con uh, conclusion allows you to kill sinners or people you perceive as sinners to eradicate disease. We saw that during the plague. Instead of asking the Jewish people that were not, not getting the plague to the same extent because they were more cleanly, instead of asking them how, they assume that disease and sin had a causal relationship and that sin degrades people into disease. And so I think that worldviews where you bring magic in and you make these logical leaps that you don't have really a causal relationship to make them, I think that you bring in danger of people. I'm very, I don't think you want to kill anyone. I merely think Thank that you. the document that you read from yeah. is immoral and taken to its logical <coughs> conclusion, it leads to immorality. Just like I don't think all people that call themselves communists want to kill, but I think if you read the Communist Manifesto, it outlines that the government should be responsible for taking away people's personal private property at the hands of force. I can promise you, if you follow a man who, as he's bleeding and dying on a cross, prays for his enemies, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, you are going to be the most tolerant, respectful human being on the planet. If you follow Jesus Christ, who prayed in his dying moment for those who nailed him to the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You don't go out and murder. You don't go out and whoop up on people. You live a life of love, compassion, and amazing tolerance, which means when you're confronted by rascals, you seek to honor them and respect them enough to answer their questions and to help them if they're hurting. I feel that I've received nothing but honor and respect, guys. William Willimon used to be dean of the chapel at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. Now he teaches at Duke Divinity School. But he began his ministry in rural Georgia. One day, he and his wife traveled to a small country funeral run by a minister from a different denomination. They arrived at the spot where the funeral was to take place. It was open casket, and the service consisted of the preacher's sermon. The preacher pounded on the pulpit and said, Joe is dead. He doesn't have any more chances, but you do. He made a lot of bad decisions. He wasted his life. Now it's too late for him, but it's not too late for you. You can make a decision today. Make the right one. As William Willimon and his wife were driving away, William turned to his wife and said, that was the most manipulative, disgusting, insensitive funeral I have ever been to. And his wife said, I agree. It was manipulative. It was insensitive. It was disgusting. But it was also true. You and I live in a culture that is getting better and better at denying death, ignoring death, glossing over death. I appreciate the scriptures which teach that you and I are not to detach from life and be unconcerned about death. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 writes, death is the last enemy. Where is the hope? Where is the hope that you and I so desperately need for life after death and for our future in this life? In Hebrews 6.19, the author of Hebrews writes, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. What's he talking about? What's the hope that is a secure anchor for your soul and my soul? It's Jesus Christ. It's the living God. Jesus Christ was dead. His disciples dispersed in disillusionment. Everyone was shocked beyond repair. But three days after he died, he rose from the dead. And over a period of 40 days, he appeared to over 500 people who saw him risen from the dead. 
This Jesus Christ promises eternal life to all who trust in him. Jesus says in John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Hope, Christian hope, hope based on Jesus Christ, is not simply wishful thinking. Rather, Christian hope, hope based on Jesus Christ, is a confidence of good in the future. In the future in this life, and in the future after death, in eternal life in heaven. It is based on the goodness of God. It's based on the fact that God is eternal. It's based on the fact that God is the creator. He gave us life in the first place. He created the cosmos, which means he's more than able to bring our dead bodies back to life, to reunite them with our souls, and to give us eternal life in a new heaven and a new earth, where there will be no more crying, no more suffering, no more pain, no more evil injustice, no more destruction, decay, and death, but eternal life with a new body, loving and serving Christ, and loving and serving each other. That is hope. It's based on the goodness of God. It's based on the fact that God is eternal, and therefore he's in a position to give us eternal life. It's based on the love of God, that he wants you to spend eternity with him in heaven. It's based on the grace of Jesus Christ, who bled and died on a cross to pay the penalty for our wrongdoing, to forgive us, and to give us the gift of eternal life. Friends, we have to be realistic. Death is real. Nobody escapes it. Jesus Christ went through death out the other side to eternal life. He is the foundation for hope. Not an insurance policy, not a bank account or a stock portfolio, not the health club, not getting a facelift or Botox treatment. That's just putting band-aids on cancer. There's a real problem. You and I have a date with death because we all have rebelled against God. But Jesus Christ offers to forgive us, to rescue us, and to give us eternal life, which means there is hope for you. There's hope for me. Have you embraced Christ? Have you put your faith in him? Do you have the hope that's like an anchor for the soul, the hope that is found in Jesus Christ? You can have that hope when you trust in Christ, when you commit your life to him, when you trust him for heaven. God bless you as you make that most important decision. I'm the pastor of Grace Community Church. We meet every Sunday morning, 9.30 at Grace Farms, located at 365 Lukeswood Road in New Canaan, Connecticut. I'd love to invite you to join us this Sunday for our 9.30 service. Thanks for joining us for these few minutes. Have a great day.